Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Jim Ippolito about 45 years of biosolid research from Colorado. Biosolids are the human waste products that are managed and produced by wastewater treatment plants. While many simply flush and forget their waste, biosolids can have a variety of advantageous environmental impacts when applied at proper rates and locations. In this episode, as part two of our mini-series on the Clean Water Act, Jim discusses how researchers have utilized these benefits across various land types in Colorado. Don't forget to listen to the end of our show for our student spotlight. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Jim Ippolito with us. Jim received his bachelor's degree in agronomy from the University of Delaware and his master's and PhD degrees in environmental soil chemistry and quality at Colorado State University. Jim worked for the USDA Agricultural Research Service for almost a decade as a research soil scientist before returning to Colorado State University in 2016. Jim has an extension appointment, teaches soil fertility management, researches soil health in a number of ecosystems, and runs a 40-plus year old biosolids land application program in Colorado. How are you doing today, Jim? I'm great, Abby. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. So happy to talk with you today. Um, so we are in part two of our mini series on the Clean Water Act uh, to celebrate its 50th anniversary. So you wrote kind of a review paper about biosolids research in Colorado specifically as part of that special section. So can you tell us a little bit about the Clean Water Act in general and kind of its history with Colorado and then also explain to our listeners what biosolids are and um, kind of how that whole program got started? Sure. So, you know, this is the 50th year of the Clean Water Act, although it actually started decades before 1972 with the Federal Water Pollution Control Act which was established in 1948. And that sort of morphed into the Clean Water Act in 1972 due to, due to a number of reasons. And I don't know if, if you know this or our listeners know this, but there was a fire on the, I'm gonna hack the name, Cuyahoga River outside of Cleveland in the late 60s. And this, this didn't really attract that much attention, but um, some major newspapers or news articles caught wind of this. And then the next couple of years, published this nationwide, these issues that we're, we're facing or we were facing in the environment. And, and that really started, I guess, the environmental movement towards the, the morphing of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948 to the Clean Water Act of 1972. And that's, that's actually been morphed and modified over time. But the beginnings of, of what we do with biosolids land application really started in 1972. And so, you know, with that said, biosolids is tied really closely with the Clean Water Act. So the Clean Water Act, essentially, it protects the water bodies of the United States against pollution for environmental purposes, you know, environmental quality or improvements, environmental quality and improvements to human health, essentially. And so the story with biosolids is this. Humans are, I mean, we're pretty good at polluting. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're just really good at polluting. There, for every action, there's an equal and maybe opposite reaction, right? That's uh, Newton. In humans, we, we eat, we poop. The poop goes somewhere. Usually if you live in a town and municipality, a city, it runs to a wastewater treatment facility that cleans that water to standards that are set forth in the Clean Water Act of 1972. Well, when we do that, we create biosolids. Your poop is digested typically in some form or fashion, depending on the treatment process at the municipal wastewater treatment facility. And the solids that are left over at the end used to be called sewage sludge. We morphed that name over time to something that's a little more, I guess, attractive, if you will, to biosolids. And that solid material, you know, to be honest with you, it has a lot of properties that act really similarly to slow-release fertilizers. And they're, so they're great sources of nutrients 
and uh, a great soil amendment, just like you know somebody was going to add manure or compost to to a parcel of land. Sure, sure. And uh, I know in your paper you mentioned Colorado was like on board from the get go. What? Why Colorado? <laughs> Yeah. What was their extreme interest in this? You know, I wish I could go back in time because the research that started in Colorado started shortly there after the Clean Water Act was enacted in 1972. Well, <laughs> I'm going to date myself, but 1972 is five years old. And, you know, I didn't know anything about Clean Water Act. I mean, I just wanted to play on my bicycle. That's about it. <laughs> I think about Colorado. You know, I've lived in Colorado most of my life. And although I didn't grow up in Colorado, I've lived in Colorado most of my life. And I think about Colorado as being a place in the United States that people really treasure the environment. Not that I'm saying other places don't, but in Colorado, you know, we've got we've got great scenic beauty. And people, I think, historically have wanted to protect that. And so here comes the Clean Water Act in Colorado. We're at the headwaters of almost, not quite, but almost, you know, well, we're at the headwaters of some major waterways, you know, like the Colorado River, for example, or the South Platte, which eventually flows into um, the Mississippi. We want to protect the waters. And so how do we do that? So hand in hand, I, th I really think what happened was Colorado was very progressive in the mid to late 70s with the research that went hand in hand with with sewage, sewage treatment, and biosolids land application to soils. And that just has cascaded over the last 45 years. We haven't really looked back, to be honest with you. Sure. Well, that's that's wonderful. Glad glad Colorado was uh, so eager to, to get on board. Obviously, as we'll see, that's kind of provided a lot of really fruitful research that everyone has been able to benefit from. So... As part of your review, you kind of talked about four regions um, or, or types of land areas that uh, this biosolids research has been conducted in Colorado. So to get started here, maybe if you'd be willing, we could talk about the four types and kind of some general examples of the kind of research that's being conducted in those areas. Okay. Yeah, the four areas that that we've sort of outlined in this review article in terms of biosolids land application have been focused on agricultural lands, mainly dry land agroecosystems. That's, you know, that dominates Colorado and the eastern plains of Colorado. We've outlined uh, the benefits to rangelands or grazing lands, forest fire burned areas, and reclamation sites that have been affected by historic mining operations like gold and silver mining operations, which we have plenty of here in the Western U.S. and Colorado is no exception. So when I think about those four major areas where we focused efforts for biosolids land application and the benefits over the last 45 years, in terms of ag land, I would say in terms of ag land, we've done the majority of work in these agro ecosystems. Oh boy, starting in 1982, through the present, we focus on ag lands and boy, where do I start? There's just been a plethora of work that's been done in ag lands. I think early on, you know, looking back early on, the work that we performed focused on trying to dial in an application rate that was conducive for, for growing dryland winter wheat in wheat fallow rotations here in the Eastern Plains or the high Eastern Plains. And not that we didn't know a whole lot, but we took sort of a shotgun approach. You know, we, we had a rough idea of what application rates were needed, but then we, we didn't do a good job of bracketing those application rates. We had a wide application rate window, I guess, if you want to call it. And so we put down nothing to control, 3, 6, 12, and 18 dry tons of biosolids per acre, and I can tell you from our long-term research, dryland winter wheat needs about two to three dry tons per acre. But we were putting on 12 and 18 dry tons per acre. I mean, excessive. And so I think about some of the work that you can do as a scientist, which is really fun, is you can make an oops, and it can be actually positive. 
because you can study the oops instead of doing something like a municipality who is spreading biosolids and actually making an oops and not knowing what to do afterwards. So that's the beauty of being a scientist. And so I think about some of the maybe not quite so early work, but early enough, like in the oh early 90s, mid 90s, we looked at the oopses, the 18 dry tons per acre. And if you stopped applying, what could you expect in terms of that system recovering? And it, it appears it takes uh, about three cropping cycles or six years if you're working in wheat fallow for the system that's, I would say, a little bit out of whack in terms of macro and micronutrients to snap back due to reactions in the environment with these micro and macronutrients to actually look like the control. So that's the beauty of being a scientist. And then I think about all the other work we've done. We've, we've taken what we started with, these really wide application rates, and we morphed that into another project that bracketed the agronomic rate, the rate by which the biosolids supply the right amount of nitrogen to feed the crop over a growing uh, season without putting down too much biosolids. So not putting down too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus, et cetera. And we studied that for 20 years and that morphed into something completely different where we actually are applying agronomic rates to dryland wheat or dryland corn when biosolids are needed. So if the soil already has plenty of nitrogen because we had a crop failure in the past, we don't apply biosolids. And if we have a great crop in one year, that crop removes nitrogen and phosphorus, et cetera, and we typically apply. And we base our application rates on what the crop needs. So we're, we're not bracketing application rates anymore. We're actually targeting the agronomic rate for biosolids to, su to supply nitrogen to crops. And we've been doing that for 23 years now. So that's Agland. Wow. It's wow. I, you know, the story just keeps going on and on. I know we're going to talk about some of the other aspects in terms of beneficial use that I'll target. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to and target from the Agland research we've done. The rangeland research that we've performed is actually, I think, some of the most exciting work I've ever done in my life. To be honest with you. It may sound boring to a lot of people, but man, I think about some of the terms that are tossed around nowadays, like sustainability and resiliency, and they they tend to be talked about almost haphazardly. But when I think about the work that we started in grazed rangelands in 1991, when I was just a quote kid, that we still study today, we without a doubt can say that the biosolids that we've applied at a certain rate, a sweet spot, I call it sometimes, at five dry tons per acre, increases plant productivity to the point where the plants that are being consumed by grazing animals, cattle, are, are healthier, they're more abundant, which supports that, that cattle population. And I can tell you for a fact that the soil health in those systems is better than if you didn't apply anything. And it's sustainable. It's been sustainable for 30 years. And we can see that. And so what we've done is in 1991, we did something very similar to what we did when we started in our Agland research. We took sort of a shotgun approach. We had a rough idea of what the target application rate should be, but we, we had a really broad range. And we just started a new project with the city of Fort Collins that brackets the five dry tons per acre application rate on grazed rangelands. So we're hoping to land some funding to really look at this in detail. And it's a really fun project because the city, what they did was they applied these, these biosolids at zero, two and a half, five, and seven and a half dry tons per acre on really big plots, 70 feet wide by about a thousand feet long. And it takes up, I don't know, it might, it might take up a section of land out on their research site. Well, their beneficial research or beneficial reuse site north of Fort Collins. And what they did was they put out webcams that take still images when there's movement. And so when the cattle are out there grazing, what we're hoping to do is capture all of these images and put them together to create a video to show where the cows really like to graze. 
And so like in three or four years time, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to show you these videos. It's going to be really cool. You'll be like, wow, that's really interesting. They're all gathered over here. I'm like, well, that just so happens to be the five dry ton per acre application rate. Oh my gosh. Yes, please do. <laughs> yeah, it'll be really cool. Um, forest fire burned areas. We got lucky in, <laughs> we got unlucky and lucky in 1997. There was a forest fire just west of Denver in part of the watershed that feeds water to the city of Denver. And it burned everything. I mean, it just decimated all above ground, basically all above ground plant growth. And then we had one of these 500 year rain events that caused erosional losses. And so the city needed to do something about it. And so what we did was we applied biosolids at different rates to these areas, sort of across contours in this burn area to try to prevent erosion from or sediment moving into water bodies that eventually end up in a drinking water treatment facility that needs to be cleaned before it goes out into the municipal infrastructure. So you can just imagine more sediment and water costs more to clean the water. So that's what we were trying to do. And, you know, there were some other aspects of that project that included nutrient movement and actually some heavy metal movement that we found could be reduced with biosolids line application at the proper application rates, which was a great study. And then the reclamation sites, boy, there's been reclamation sites that have used biosolids all over Colorado. And I think about areas that I was not involved with, but the oil, oil shale industry or natural gas industry on the west side of Colorado has used biosolids to help reclaim areas after uh, mining operations. I think about some work that was started by Sally Brown, who's a professor at, at uh, the University of Washington. She'd started some work with somebody named Rufus Cheney, who used to work for the USDA Agricultural Research Service. This is work that occurred up in Leadville, Colorado, and Eric, that, an area that's been historically mined for, for gold and silver. A lot of silver, actually. And here's, here's kind of the short of the story. People, you know, they get gold crazy back in the 1800s, and they go mine for gold, and they, they remove the gold from the ore. And what do they do with the ore? They throw it over their shoulder. You know, I'm kind of making this up, but this is basically what's happened. They throw it over their shoulder. It goes into a water body. It gets washed down the water body, and it's deposited somewhere, like on a bend of a stream or a creek or a river. And then that material just sits there, and it has, at least in Colorado, in this area, has a mineral called pyrite. It's fool's gold. It looks like gold, but it's not gold. And when it's exposed to the atmosphere, it... I'll keep this short, but it basically creates acid, which degrades other rocks and minerals and releases heavy metals to the environment, which can kill fish in the water, which did kill fish in the water. And so Sally Brown and Rufus Cheney back in 95 um, applied biosolids and lime. The lime was added to raise the pH to offset the acidity. And the biosolids was added as an organic amendment and a nutrient source to kind of kickstart the system to grow plants to stabilize these areas so they wouldn't erode and end up dumping heavy metals back into the, the headwaters of it's the Arkansas River. So anyway, we've studied that about, no, oh, for the last 15 or 20 years. Some of the work we just haven't published yet, but looking at, among other things, the changes in soil health and productivity on the site to stabilize these. And it's been, uh, I'll tell you, it's been a positive experience. Um, for the most part, soil health has improved. The site's certainly stabilized. It's used as almost a world-class fishery now, to be honest with you. People just love going to this location. So that's, those are those four stories in a nutshell. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Jim's paper, The Clean Water Act and Biosolids, a 45-year chronological review of biosolids land application research in Colorado, published in the Journal of Environmental Quality, is always freely available. 
We'd also like to highlight the Clean Water Act at 50, the golden anniversary of a Blue Policy special section, which will be fully available in the September-October issue of the Journal of Environmental Quality. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Let's get back to the show. How are biosolids actually applied in these areas? I, I mean, I'm assuming there's probably different machinery and types if you're on the slopes of a forest versus rangeland versus, you know, an agronomic field. So how, how are these applied? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you can think of it or dream it, that's how it's applied. <laughs> so <laughs> some of the early work before I started at Colorado State University, it was applied actually to our ag fields as a liquid. So back in the early 80s, at least at the treatment facilities that we were working with, they didn't have I would call it relatively high tech equipment to dewater the biosolids. So coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, the biosolids had like 3% solids, it's mostly liquid. And so to apply it, it was hosed on from something like a water truck and all the plots had berms around them to keep the, the effluent in place. Then that sort of morphed and I can't remember when the municipality put in um, dewatering mechanics, you know, like centrifuges and belt presses, things that would push water out. And they do that for a reason. So they don't have to haul water. They can haul solids and it's more cost effective. But they did that. And then on our plots, what we would do is we would hand apply it. So we would bring out a, a field balance and a whole bunch of garbage cans and some shovels and with sweat equity, we would weigh it, put it on with a front loader, and then disc it in with a rototiller. We've morphed over time. We don't do that anymore because we have large plots. Our plots that we use now are 50 feet wide by a half a mile long. And so they're applied with a manure spreader, basically. That's um, that's under ag land. In rangelands, they're, they're also, the like rangelands that we work with, they're applied with manure spreaders. But some of the more recent manure spreaders are, they're complicated and they're high tech. And so, I mean, they, they can do anything you want. It's incredible. I, I can't, I can't really explain it to you because I've only seen these pieces of equipment once, but you know, you can drive a certain speed and it really doesn't matter. The machine itself will adjust itself automatically to apply the rate that you want to apply. And it can be dialed way down to probably like half a ton per acre, which is, impossible to get with manure spreaders. Um, sometimes dump trucks come out. Like at Leadville, a dump truck probably came out because they put down 100 dry tons per acre. You you can't put that down with a manure spreader. So a dump truck came out and dumped it out. Yeah, if you if you can think of it, it's it's how it's been applied. Uh, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll say one other thing. You know, I've noticed some of the work that Sally Brown's done. Sally has worked in biosolids line application for her almost her whole career. And I admire her work and I admire the pictures that she shares with us. And where she works near Seattle, Washington, they actually, they spray apply it. So it's more of a liquid, but they spray apply, apply it in forested ecosystems for, for beneficial reuse. All right. Okay. I love, I love that about science. Whenever I hear scientists that have like these hacks of just like, oh, well, we just had to use like these day-to-day -day materials to make it work. And I mean, obviously these fancy machines are not just making it work, but it's always fun to hear how, how people do dream up the ways to, to get the research done. You know, I, I have to tell you another story about applications. So in the forest fire burned area, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly how these were applied, but they were composted biosolids, and they were applied with this really intense-looking machine that came through, pushed down the burned dead trees, chopped them up, basically mulched them, and rototilled them. Is that right? They rototilled them into the soil, and then we came through with composted biosolids applied on top of that. And I think those were incorporated as well. 
but the machine that they use was something like from a construction site that you would mm -hmm. never see under normal land application scenarios. It was this giant piece of equipment that, you know, you just wanted, well, I just wanted to drive. <laughs> but, right, try, right. <laughs> like, wow, I want to get behind the wheel of that. That looks like fun. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, man. Oh, that's super fun. <laughs> okay. To that end, uh, we did want to talk more about um, some of the major accomplishments that have come out of this research. There's a, a whole list. Um, so if you want to talk about some of that, that would be great. Yeah, I think about some of the major accomplishments, and there's there's plenty of them. You know, that paper that we just finished writing could have been way more dense, to be honest with you. It's still, it's good, it's good bedtime reading, I guess I'll call it. <laughs> I'm really proud of the fact that we've done this, though, in Colorado. And I think about the major accomplishments, and, you know, I think about the Clean Water Act and the rules and regulations that are within the Clean Water Act that regulate the beneficial reuse of biosolids. And some of the work that we've done, not only in Colorado, but in conjunction with people like myself in other states, other land-grant institutions have gone into formulating the rules and regulations within the Clean Water Act. Now, a lot of that occurred before I really came on board, but nonetheless, it's part of a major accomplishment. And it's something we still focus on today, so I'm really proud of that. Um, I'm, I'm proud of some of the accomplishments from our research that have gone into shaping the rules and regulations within Colorado in terms of biosolids line application. And I think about the work that we've performed to dial in how much nitrogen would be released from, say, one dry ton of biosolids when it's land applied to an ag land and taking something that sounds really simple when I'm explaining it to you, but had taken probably, you know, 15 to 20 years to really formulate to morph into something that could be beneficially reused for land applicators in the state of Colorado. And I'll tell you that the regulations in Colorado before we, we really took the research that we did and applied it to these regulations, the, the regulations were, I would say, cumbersome in terms of land application. You had to go through a number of different steps and iterations and gyrations to come up with land application rates. And based on the work that Ken Barbrick and myself and others had done over the years, we whittled that, those regulations down into something that was just really simple and manageable. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. Um, like going, going way back, you know, some of the early work that was performed in terms of, you mentioned polishing of water, well, polishing of wastewater. Really, the first work that ever occurred in Colorado dealt with taking sewage effluent, the you know liquid portion that's coming out of the back end of a wastewater treatment facility, and essentially running it downward through soil to polish it, to clean the water. And I would imagine that the scientists that did this work back in the mid to late 70s knew what was going to happen. But... It's something that wasn't really studied in Colorado and maybe elsewhere at the time. And so, you know, one can imagine now, because we've done this for so many years, that putting anything through soil, soil is a great filter. And it's a, it's a great means by which you can capture nutrients or pollutants, hold them in place for microbial degradation to occur or plant uptake to occur. Um, but that's some of the early work that happened that really kind of rolled into all of the work that myself and others have done over the last 30 or 40, 45 years. That's where it really started. Um, what else did we talk about? Sustainable ecosystems. We already talked about that a little bit with the rangeland system. And we talked about improved plant and soil health with the rangeland system. I'll tell you that we see similar responses in ag lands. I can't tell you if it's sustainable or resilient yet because I just can't. Every year is different. And I, I'm not comfortable saying sustainable or resilient in these systems, but I can tell you that soil health has been improved with biosolids land application over time. It acts like a slow release fertilizer. That's something that we've proved in years where we have ample, like average precipitation or greater than average precipitation. Oh yeah, biosolids acts like a slow release fertilizer. And it actually releases nitrogen slowly over the growing season, especially right at the peak when the, the plant needs it. 
So for wheat, when wheat starts going into something called boot stage, where the, the grain is starting to form and it's coming out of the, for lack of a better term, it's emerging from the plant, it's coming out of the plant upwards. That plant needs a lot of nitrogen. It's pushing a lot of nitrogen from the roots, from the leaves up into the grain. And if you have a constant slow supply of nitrogen from a source like biosolids, it is completely beneficial for the plant. And you'll see greater yield increases. And sometimes you'll actually see greater protein content, which is important for the wheat that we grow in Colorado, which is used for bread making. Oh, the time bomb theory. Here's another major accomplishment. So when I first started working on this project in the early 90s, there was a theory called the time bomb theory. And this is, and I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase it, but this is how this went. So you have this, this material, biosolids, and it contains, among other things, it also contains some heavy metals. And it's not surprising, you know, it contains copper and it contains zinc because copper and zinc are part of the municipal infrastructure. We have copper piping in our house, houses, there's zinc solder in our houses. Well, that signature ends up in the biosolids. And so the time bomb theory was essentially this, that biosolids are high in organic compounds and hmm, organic compounds like to sorb or sequester or hold on to copper and zinc and other heavy metals and other nutrients. But cop well, I'll just pick on copper and zinc. So biosolids can sorb or sequester or hold on to copper and zinc in an organic phase. So you have an organic material that's kind of grabbing or grabbing a hold of copper or zinc. You add a large amount of organic material, biosolids to soil. And it's organic, so microorganisms are going to break it down. And the time bomb theory was essentially this, that the microorganisms in a soil would break down these biosolids and release a plume of copper and zinc and potentially other heavy metals to the environment. So you had this time bomb effect, right? So sooner or later, boom, all these metals are released to the environment. And I'm really proud of the fact that not only our group at CSU, but other groups around the country uh, debunked this. And we, we should, I mean, soil scientists, we know this, but I don't think the general public really knows this, that soils have all sorts of actions and reactions that occur all the time. And there's other forms that can capture and hold on to copper and zinc in soils and reduce their availability to plants, to animals, and to humans. And the time bomb theory essentially was debunked by, among other people, our group at CSU. And in fact, you know, some of the things that we showed back in the early or mid 1990s was that the plants that were growing in these systems that might have a little bit of excessive copper or zinc, the plants only take up so much and exclude the rest. So plants are actually pretty smart organisms. You know, they say, okay, that's enough. I don't need any more. And it's, it's actually really beautiful. Um, I want to talk about biofortification. This is something that's actually probably, besides the soil health work that we've performed and sustainability and rangeland systems, is one of the most proudest things I've had an opportunity to work on in my career. And so I love this story, I'm going to tell you. So, you know, you go to the grocery store and maybe you go down the cereal aisle and you pick up a box of cereal and it says, oh, it's biofortify with zinc, or more often it's biofortify with iron, but it might say zinc. And you might think that's pretty good. And guess what it is? But it's biofortified with iron or zinc, meaning iron or zinc has been added to the cereal when it was being processed and created because the cereal itself or the product that the cereal was made from was lacking iron or zinc. Well, guess what? <laughs> Every single living organism on the face of the planet needs iron and zinc, including humans. And there's, you know, there's FDA regulations or suggested guidelines for how much humans should be taking in, in terms of iron or zinc per day. And so if you buy a box of cereal that says biofortify with zinc, it's added because you're not going to get your daily allowance of zinc if you just ate it without the zinc being added. So here's the story. This is a great story, right? So if you look 
across the planet. There's about right now 8 billion people on the face of the planet. And this is a rough guesstimate, depends on where you're located, but approximately 20% of that population is at risk of zinc deficiency symptoms. So 20% of 8 billion is a lot, right? It's not quite 20, or it's not quite 2 billion people, <laughs> 2 billion people. Um, if you lack zinc in your diet, it can cause all sorts of things. Um, growth stunting, mental impairment, it actually ends up causing um, premature death in people because of uh, the side effects of lack of zinc. So here comes biosolids. And some of the work that we published, this was maybe five years ago, where we proved that biosolids, when applied at a, a rate, an agronomic rate, meaning the nitrogen needs, meeting the nitrogen needs of, of wheat, when we apply based on the nitrogen needs of wheat over and over again for like 15 years, 20 years, that we actually, and let me take a step back. When we apply in these systems, we apply without incorporating. It's all surface application, no incorporation. What we find is that the zinc concentrations in the soil, especially the upper por portion of soil, like zero to five centimeters, that's two inches, or zero to 10 centimeters, that's about five inches. We see, we see increases in bioavailable zinc that are taken up by the plant that are translocated to the grain and actually biofortify zinc above the threshold that's, quote, required for humans. And so I think about this in terms of almost 2 billion people on the face of the planet suffering from zinc deficiency symptoms. And this is just a great story of the benefits of biosolids in terms of land application to systems that really need zinc. And the same thing actually happens with iron to a little bit lesser extent, but it happens. I'm really proud of that work that we've performed. And that's the beauty of long-term research is you couldn't do this type of work in a two or three year study in a field or a greenhouse project. You need somebody to support you for the long term. And we have that. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That is that is a wonderful story and obviously just a ton of incredible research. But as you mentioned before, the science just keeps keeps moving forward. The story continues. So looking ahead, what are some of the future research um, projects that your team is looking into? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I wouldn't call it my team. I would call it the team I work with because this is bigger than just at Colorado State University. So some of the future research that the team is focusing on are forever chemical compounds, so these PFASs and PFOAs, these chemical compounds that are, are really difficult to break down in the environment by microorganisms. And so these are, these are chemical compounds that can accumulate in the food chain and in humans and can cause um, all sorts of issues, you know, reproductive issues, cancer, et cetera. And so the team that I work with across the country, folk, and it's a group of people that are focused from land grant institutions primarily, but not exclusively. And it's a, I like to use the term W4170. It's a, it's a USDA hatch funded project that supports people like myself at land grant institutions across the country to focus on, among other things, soil health with biosolids land application and emerging contaminants and biosolids land application. And so we're, we're starting a new program this year funded through hopefully the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service to focus on fate, transport, and degradation of forever chemical compounds in a number of different scenarios that span not quite the entire U.S., but, you know, in key strategic locations within the U.S. And under different application scenarios, you know, sort of what I've mentioned before, you know, application scenarios where maybe you have surface application with no incorporation, surface application with incorporation, um, dry land systems, high precipitation systems, systems where effluent is actually used instead of 
uh, solid biosolids. And the list sort of goes on and on. And looking at the fate and transport and degradation of these compounds in the environment. And so I think that's, you know, well, I know that's where we're going with the group that I work with. There's other people that are looking at microplastics, but we're not really targeting those. We're really targeting these forever chemical compounds. Not that microplastics are not forever chemical compounds because they are, but our focus right now is these PFASs and PFOAs. Okay. And where where do those come from? Because I'm not familiar with those terms. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So these chemical compounds end up or can end up in biosolids basically from cleaning of the wastewater with these chemical compounds ending up in the solid material, the biosolids. But they don't come from biosolids and they don't come from municipal wastewater treatment plants. They come from the use of everyday products that we as humans utilize. So these forever chemical compounds are materials that are embedded in flame retardants, materials that are used to prevent you know, your chair in your house that you're sitting in right now from catching on fire or spreading. They're in cookware, like nonstick cookware, although I would imagine not a lot comes off nonstick cookware. But, you know, eventually these materials are weathered and worn. Like they could be in the clothing that we're wearing right now. You know, you wash your clothing, you wash your dishes, everything goes down the drain and people just don't think twice about it. It's like pooping. You flush the toilet and you don't think about it. It just goes somewhere. Well, all those chemical compounds go somewhere and they end up in biosolids. And, you know, I think there's been a lot of finger pointing that biosolids are that are, they're, the, they're the culprit, but they're not the culprit. Regardless, biosolids researchers, we have to deal with these. And so regardless of where they come from, we're dealing with their fate and transport in the environment and potential uptake in the food chain. And so we're hoping to really tackle this in greater detail over the next several years. Sure, sure. Yeah, obviously uh, a huge issue and very well connected in with the Clean Water Act, I would imagine. So I've got three questions left for you. The first one is if people want to learn more about any of the research we've talked about today or the Clean Water Act or anything like that, where can they go? That's a great question. I love Google. I mean, you can Google it. So, you know, before we got online today, one of the things I was doing was just typing in biosolids and then a state name. And I didn't do this for all 50 states, but I, I looked at states where you know, I'm somewhat familiar with. And if you just typed in biosolids and the name of your state, you'll end up receiving a heck of a lot of information, probably too much information. That's not a bad place to start. In terms of the Clean Water Act, you know, the history of the Clean Water Act, Google it, just type in history of the Clean Water Act and it'll give you way too much information. Um, Wikipedia is probably a great place to go because it's it's easily consumable and it's not as technical as, say, jumping on, like, U.S. EPA website, for example. Sure, sure. Great advice. Uh, second question is, if people that want to kind of take the next step to be involved in either this research or, you know, these issues at large, what can they do? You know, I don't know where I would start if I, I didn't know enough to be dangerous because I've been doing this type of work for over 30 years in my career. And I would go to, I would go to your state's Department of Public Health and Environment or whatever it's called. It might be the State Department of Environmental Quality to find out more about what's occurring in your state and how can you get involved. That That is probably the first step I would take, to be honest with you. Sure. And finally, what is one fun fact, um, or I have I have a plural here, so I think there might might have been two, uh, that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? Yeah, fun facts. I could spend all day talking about fun facts about me. That'd be fun. I'm not going to, but I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you a couple. So uh, maybe the, the big one is my wife is a soil scientist as well. She's oh. actually... Yeah. So I'm a soil chemist by training and she's a soil microbiologist by training. So we actually have worked together over the years and have published together, which is kind of fun. And we're, we're um, five years apart in age. So we didn't overlap in school at all. We met after 
in our jobs, but her career has sort of followed mine. And so I received my undergraduate at the University of Delaware. She actually, several years after I graduated, received a master's degree from Delaware. And the people that she went to, to the University of Delaware with in terms of graduate school are people that I actually work with right now in the soil chemistry realm. It's just really, really, it's a really cool fun fact. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a super fun fact. I like that very much. <laughs> yeah, and another fun fact about me is I'm, I tend to be goal-oriented without seeing the goal when I first start. But when I get close, I, it's actually something that I just thrive or strive for. And um, so I've climbed all of Colorado's 14,000-foot mountains and others outside of the state. But there's not too many people that have done that. And I feel pretty good telling you that I've done that myself. <laughs> Wow, that is very impressive. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, both excellent fun facts. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you for all of the research that you have done um, over the years. You, uh, your team, other teams, the team at large, uh, obviously doing wonderful, wonderful work that is making a huge difference uh, in a lot of different areas. So thank you for the, all of that. And thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Abby. Hi, everyone. And welcome to our student spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Leandro. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ab, for inviting me to participate of the Field Lab Earth podcast. My name is Leandro Vieira Filo. I am a third year PhD student in the Soil and the Water Science Department at the University of Florida. I'm now located in the main campus because my advisor, Dr. Maria Silveira, is located in South Florida at the Ranch Cattle Research and the Education Center. Wonderful. And what are you currently researching? My doctoral research is mainly focused on soil phosphorus dynamics and the agronomic and environmental impact of phosphorus applications to grazing land ecosystems. We have a special focus on the effect of biosolid application to pastures. Biosolids contain substantial amounts of plant nutrients and often act as a low release fertilizer. However, the long-term application may result in phosphorus accumulation in the soil. For the ones that don't know, biosolids is the sewage sludge after being treated to meet the regulatory agent's requirement. We have conducted three experiments so far to understand how phosphorus management impacts soil health, water quality, and forage production. We have very promising data, and our first paper may be coming out pretty soon. Great. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? Well, uh, I think I don't have a dream project yet, as long as I am working with soil chemistry, soil fertility, and plant nutrition, I will be fulfilled. Also, I enjoy extension as much as research. So a project I can work with both research and extension would be a pleasure to conduct. On the other hand, I like to work with the biosolids effects in the soil. I would be glad to continue fighting the misperception that people still have regarding this valuable source of nutrients and organic matter. For example, the rules to apply biosolids in Florida became more and more strict last year and less biosolids can be applied per, per area. In addition, some fields are not eligible anymore to receive biosolids to the new regulation, but there is no scientific data supporting this reduction in the rate that can be applied. It's the opposite. Scientific data shows that the previous biosolids rates were not jeopardized in water quality. All right. If you'd like to get in touch with Leandro about his work, we'll have his contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.